Uh, Simon, sit there. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can begin. Yeah, let's live. Can you tell? There we go. Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to Saitlander's Thursday Night Live. Uh, I'm sorry for the little delay. There, were, uh, there was a communication hiccup between myself and our very, very venerable guest. Tonight, we are privileged to be able to chat with the one man in the world who is probably most highly regarded for the work that he has done in the USA to defend the rights of decent, respectable, God-fearing people to carry firearms. And we uh, contacted him recently to ask him if he would come on this show to provide us with a few words of comfort, a few words of encouragement, perhaps, as we stare into the abyss of a future in which we may not be able to legally and lawfully possess firearms for self-defense in a country which has among the highest rates of murder in the world, among the highest rates of rape in the world, if not in the case of rape, the highest rate, and has a farm murder rate that is incomparable to the homicide rate of any other class of citizen anywhere in the world. A farm murder rate, perhaps as high as 184 per 100,000 against the national murder rate of about 37 per 100,000. And it is uh, given much perspective when you consider that in the USA, where liberals are hysterically lobbying for gun control, the, uh, the, the homicide rate by firearm is 4.88. So it's ironic that actually we should be talking to the most august gentleman in the US gun rights faction, if you like, to look for support. But we are struggling to get it anywhere else. So I would ask you right now, in your homes, in your hearts, to give a warm welcome to Mr. Larry Pratt of Gun Owners of America. Mr. Larry Pratt. Hey, good evening to you. Thank you so much for reaching out and getting in touch. I'm delighted to be able to uh, have a conversation with you. Um, I, I have uh, been aware of the events in South Africa for quite some time, and I share your concern. What you just said, I don't think is alarmist. Uh, it may be alarming to a number of people, but it's certainly, uh, I think, in order. Uh, I think people should be uh, re reacting accordingly uh, because these are not normal times, certainly not in South Africa. And I would say that if uh, we were to continue on the path that we've em recently embarked on with the last election, and I would submit that that election was not decided by who had the most votes, but who controlled the most election processes. Um, in, in any case, uh, uh, we're, we're maybe behind you, but we're not too happily on the same path. And we'd like to see you come back. That would give us some hope. Uh, I think there is a possibility here in the United States that if we have anything resembling a clean election uh, in 2022, that uh, we may well see a, uh, a real uh, smashing of Democrats, liberals, socialists at the polls. Uh, one of the things they have done that has gotten a lot of people paying more attention than ever before is on the issue of illegal immigration. And uh, I could, uh, for the most dramatic example of how this may be 
turning our electoral course around is what happened recently, just a couple of Saturdays ago in McAllen, Texas. McAllen is, perhaps it's correct to say the southernmost part of the, the United States, certainly uh, uh, in the middle of the continent. Uh, McAllen is deep inside of Mexican territory, if you will, uh, on a point of land. And McAllen is some 85% Hispanic. Um, that's a place I could use my Spanish uh, uh, with great abandon because uh, there, that's the first language of many of the hmm. people living there, even though many of them are three and four generations. Well, they voted Democrat for the last quarter century until last Saturday. Uh, or Saturday a week ago, they uh, elected a Republican mayor and a conservative Republican mayor, somebody who has taken a strong position against uh, open borders, somebody who is for fiscal control, is pro-life, uh, pro-family, uh, the, the whole uh, bundle of issues that uh, normally would characterize a conservative. And uh, Mr. Uh, Villalobos um, won that election fairly handily. It was stunning because the Democrats had not expected to lose that election in that place because uh, the Democrat roots are so uh, deep and the pattern of voting there is so well established pro-Democrat. Well, the people there have now had firsthand experience with what it means to live under a Democrat government. Perhaps the uh, somewhat the same as many people in South Africa have had an education in what it's like to live under the communist government, if I may call it that, uh, mm. certainly a far left government. And mm. so now we're, we're looking at uh, other elections that have been held. Some, uh, I think we, there are enough like McAllen, Texas, we can now say there's a trend. And unless there is completely uncontrolled voter fraud, uh, the 2022 elections are likely to show a rebound for Republicans in the United States Congress and in other races as well. Uh, Mr. Pratt, before we go on much longer, I just want to elaborate to people a little bit more about your pedigree. I'm going to be as brief as possible. When I did the research on you uh, about a week ago, I made all sorts of notes, and really the, the list of your achievements was so long that I'm going to have to leave about half of them out, uh, or more than half, Please quite do. frankly. But for our audience's benefit, in 1976, you took over Gun Owners of America, which is a lobbying group, if, if I may put it that way, for gun rights. You're also famous for having been the chairman of uh, Pat Buchanan's presidential campaign. And that is notable to people like ourselves because we tend to be very much more conservative than the average, because we are family-based and uh, uh, State Landers is an uh, overtly Christian organization. Uh, the, the Pat Buchanan campaign at the time, for those of us who are old enough to remember it, was something very, very, very special. You're also a former member of the U.S. Uh, state of Virginia House of Delegates. So you were a, a state, uh, uh, part of the state government, the state parliament, as we, as we understand it. And you are cited, although it's unconfirmed, I don't know whether it's a clandestine thing or not, uh, whether we should or shouldn't mention it, but you are cited as being... A, a senior fellow, uh, to use the words that I read, of the Council for National Policy, which is a very highly thought of, esteemed, august uh, conservative grouping in the in the USA. Uh, can you please tell us a little bit about the work that you did as the head of Gun Owners of America? You are now, as I understand it, the Emeritus Executive Director of uh, Gun Owners of America. Uh, so you've, you've taken, a, I suppose, a, a semi-retirement position. But for that many years, you were the guy. When CNN wanted to interview somebody on sensitive gun rights matters, you were the go-to man. Please tell us more about the work that you did 
uh, over so many years. One of the important things to mention about the work of Gun Owners of America is how we developed, uh, uh, we were among several groups on the right that were developing a large grassroots constituency. And we increasingly found that as the internet became available, uh, it was a handy tool. It wasn't something that uh, only a few people were privileged to be able to use because originally it had been developed by the US government and the military. Uh, we found that we could communicate with people literally weeks sooner than when we were just able to use the United States mail. Because you've got to think of something that uh, is going to impact. You've got to get it written. You've got to get it through production, which takes quite a while. And then you've got to trust it to the United States mail. And uh, that takes quite a bit of time, particularly if you're mailing uh, at a rate that organizations such as ours would tend to use. Now, uh, we get an, uh, a concern developed in the morning and we can have a, an email out before dinner. And people, when they're reviewing their uh, email at home, uh, are able, or even at the office, are able to uh, see what we've put out and we embed in the email a link uh, to enable them to send an email to uh, the appropriate politician, usually a member of Congress. Uh, and we have the ability to know uh, that if they live at this uh, postal zip code, uh, that we're able to then address them as someone living in this particular politician's uh, district, um, mm -hmm. state or congressional U.S. House of Representatives district. That has enabled the uh, communication between uh, the people and the politicians uh, is the time link is so much shorter. Uh, we're able to do things so much more quickly. And the impact has uh, been significant on the development of public policy. Politicians in the past had assumed that uh, by the time anybody found out what they were doing, it was too late. And you might be able to complain, but hey, uh, the next election still many months away and we're not real concerned about you. But now they realize that we can communicate with them, uh, with their constituents uh, on a daily basis if need be, uh, with updates on what's happening or not happening. And we can give them the precise communication information they need to contact their member of Congress in the US House or the US Senate. And for that matter, we can do the same thing at the state level. So the ability of the people to participate in the political process has been significantly aided by the, the internet and by particularly email. And I, I would hope that this is something that can be used not just in the United States, but in places around the world, because one of the things that I think is true of politicians everywhere, no matter what culture they're in, no matter what language they spend, uh, uh, they speak, is the uh, uh, a saying that was popular with a, uh, a leader of the United States Senate decades ago, Everett Dirksen, senator from Illinois, uh, when they still had Republicans in Illinois. Um, and he would uh, often say, uh, when I feel the heat, I, uh, I see the light. And indeed, light and heat seem to be still quite closely connected. And if you can put the heat on, they often see the light. Mm. Uh, before I respond to you, Ernst, please look at your messages. Ernst, Ernst, please look at your messages. Um, uh, Mr. Pratt, what role do you guys play in terms of, uh, you, you have members, I believe that your mailing list is something like 2 million strong. Saitlander's yeah. organization, which I've described to you at length, uh, you, you are familiar with who we are and what we are and uh, what we're preparing for and why we exist. Saitlander's organization is very strong in social media. We have two good websites, one in English, one in Afrikaans. In fact, technically speaking, we have three websites. We send out uh, WhatsApp messages to our members uh, daily. I myself run three enormous WhatsApp groups 
keeping people uh, informed of, uh, let us say, the concerns of the global Christian conservative cause worldwide and in South Africa. And so we do that kind of stuff, I would say, pretty well and probably better than any similar organization I came across in the, in the USA uh, on the many trips that I've uh, uh, done to the USA and the long periods of time that I've spent there. So we're, we're strong in that regard. What I'm interested to know is where did you guys find your strength? What was it that led people to say, I'm not going to join the NRA or I am, but I'm also going to join uh, Gun Owners of America? Uh, what is it that led people to believe that you were doing the right thing in the right way for the right reason for them to put their support behind you? Uh, I'll just finish before I give you an opportunity to answer by remarking that last week I chatted with one of our top supporters in the USA, magnificent man, and uh, he said to me that there are rumors he, he knows you quite well, not person to person, but uh, he, he, he can uh, quote you chapter and verse. Uh, he said that there are rumors that your membership is. Uh Then the NRA, the last I knew, they had some uh, 5 million people that were uh, in a political list of a much larger organization of the NRA. So of their millions and millions, 5 million are part of an Institute for Legislative Action. Well, we now have 2 million and growing. Uh, and the, the folks that are on our list are there as much as anything, because they see that we are action oriented, that we will be communicating with them virtually as things are happening uh, in Washington, but in increasingly now in state capitals. And so that uh, is, is something that uh, the activist wants. Many times people thought that if they had joined the NRA, uh, that was all they needed to do. But the NRA wasn't reaching out to involve them, to mobilize them uh, as a political army, so to speak. And so uh, that was the niche that Gun Owners of America uh, saw and, and was able to fill. And we have now become uh, so uh, uh, active that one of the fellows uh, some time ago was up on Capitol Hill talking to a staff member in a congressman's office. And the, the staffer said, oh, you're for gun, from Gun Owners of America. Your email are loud. In other words, uh, they hear from us, they hear from us a lot, and they realize that we're not just uh, putting out information, but we are uh, quite capable and indeed do communicate with our members, particularly at, at election time. So if a member of Congress or a governor or a senator or some other politician has been saying one thing but doing another. We make sure that the voters know that uh, at election time so that they can take appropriate action. Uh, and that has been, I think, the, the, the most important development in political action. Uh, and I think there are some other organizations on the right that are now tending to do this. But clearly, the abortion issue and the gun issue are probably the two most politically potent issues. And when they communicate in this activist fashion, we tend to see politicians, uh, maybe not willingly, maybe not happily, but we tend to see them responding the way they're supposed to. And oftentimes, the way they were campaigning. I, I remember that. I served a term in the Virginia legislature in the lower house and uh, the governor and I had actually been shoulder to shoulder, literally uh, on occasion campaigning against any new taxes. Well, wouldn't you know, within weeks, as soon as the new session began and I'm in my term, um, 
I'm pointing out that what are we doing entertaining the idea of a new tax here among us Republicans? We campaigned against it. And one of my new colleagues looked at me uh, quite exasperatedly and said, Pratt, that was when we were campaigning. Now we're ruling. It's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. The, the <laughs> brazen hypocrisy of politics all over the world. Uh, There's a talk we, show host here in uh, uh, the States in Washington, D.C., Chris Plant. He may be, in my opinion, the best, one of them, certainly. And he has a number of uh, handy expressions. And one of them uh, fits this uh, discussion that we're having. Uh, without double standards, the liberals would have no standards at all. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, without double standards, the liberals would have no standards at all. I want to change tack a little bit, uh, Mr. Pratt, and ask you this question. I think it's a question that's always on everybody's minds, so to speak. How is it that the liberals cannot understand or acknowledge the argument which has been demonstrated scientifically, empirically, by all sorts of people, in, including by a panel set up by Barack Obama to address this very question. How is it that they cannot understand that it's a matter of scientific fact that when people are permitted to legally possess firearms for self-defense, the rate of firearms uh, murders, homicides, decreases. Why don't they hear this argument? Why can we not progress with this argument? Whether it be in the USA, I've, I've watched your interviews with uh, Piers Morgan, um, a genuinely rude human being, if ever there was, and he, he simply refused to allow you to complete a sentence every time you alluded to that scholarly empirical fact. What is it with them? Well, uh... Just to uh, comment on Piers Morgan, his uh, lack of manners uh, actually worked against what he was trying to do. And I heard back uh, when I was doing other interviews from people, the technical people that would give uh, feedback uh, when they knew that nobody else was listening and they would talk to uh, conservatives like me who were guests on somebody's show and they said, Piers Morgan took a terrible beating, uh, even from liberals, when he behaved in such an outrageous fashion. Because it's one thing for a liberal to not let you speak that much, and uh, but to be somewhat, uh, at least give the appearance of being polite. But he was so over the top that it actually hurt him. And uh, in fact, it wasn't too much later that he was no longer on many of the channels. Uh, he That interview that we had was on, if I'm not mistaken, on CNN. And, yes, it uh, was. He, he's no longer on CNN. Uh, he's uh, uh, now reduced to being a uh, U.S. correspondent, I think maybe for the English Daily Mail, uh, whatever. Uh, it, it, it certainly was something that people that didn't even agree with me were did not appreciate the way Piers Morgan was behaving. And they were afraid that he was losing ground for their side, which indeed he was. And so mm. uh, I was happy to have a redo uh, with Piers Morgan after that one interview that I think you're referring to. And um, it uh, did not work to his advantage to be such a lout. Uh, mm. Uh, mm. You can be firm without being a jerk. And yes. uh, uh, maybe he's learned that subsequently. And and frankly, I was surprised later to find out that he's pro-life and he's uh, right of center on a number of issues. But on the firearms issue, there's something in the UK and maybe the air they breathe. But I had interviewed a conservative author that wrote a book called Londonistan. And uh, she wrote a perfectly sensible book. I had a weekly radio show. I interviewed her uh, on her book on Londonistan. And when I happened to mention, just kind of as an aside, 
because uh, we were talking about cultural issues and how Islam views the world and how uh, many of us don't have a proper response because we don't understand where Islam is coming from. Um, and I just mentioned as an aside that what a pity that people in Britain are not able to uh, protect themselves uh, with a, by carrying a gun. I thought the interview was going to end right there at that point. Uh, a conservative without any question, a lady right of center, very clear thinking, but on that issue, she melted. And I have seen that with other uh, people. It's certainly not, you can't paint with a totally broad brush, but I think it's typical of the, the experience that England has had over the decades and decades. They started out, you could buy a gun without a license, without a permit. It was, they had better laws than we have in the United States. But that was at the beginning of the 20th century. <laughs> They've come a long way since then. Mm. Mm. They, they have come a long way. And it seems as if they've lost all sense of perspective on, you know, how things work in the real world because they live in a nanny state. They live in a yep. molly-coddled society. And therefore, they believe that the way that they perceive things must apply to everybody else. I mean, how could it work differently anyway? Look, here, as I mentioned that, earlier, the, 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 the rate of intentional homicide by firearm in the USA is something like 4.88 uh, per 100,000. In South Africa, the rate of intentional homicide is about 37 per 100,000. So many times more. And the rate of intentional with very homicide. Your gun laws are much more restrictive than they are in the United States. And that still well, hasn't reduced the, the rate of crime. Well, on the contrary, the rate of crime has gone up, and we now have a rate of intentional homicide of white farmers of something like 184 per 100,000. How do you compare one or two per 100,000 in the United Kingdom or 4.88 in the United States of America to 184 per 100,000? Uh, how... How, how, how can you dispossess a farmer of the right to defend his family from attack when they are the most murdered people of any class in the world, other than, well, I suppose, gang members? I'm talking of conventional classes, of conventional occupations, of any got, occupation uh, in the world. It's, yeah. In, uh, during the time that I was the uh, full-time executive director of Gun Owners of America, which was over 40 years, um, the office was located in Fairfax County, Virginia, which is, my office was 20 miles from the United States Capitol, uh, a very urban county uh, over- I know it, uh, I know it very well. Okay, well, the murder rate there is lower than it is in England, yet the gun laws are much less restrictive so the any idea that somehow tight gun laws, restrictive gun laws, uh, contribute to public safety just doesn't bear out. Uh, the comparison of Fairfax County with uh, any place in Great Britain shows, well, there may be some rural areas in Great Britain, but any of the, the big cities, London and whatnot, it's horrible what's going on in those places because mm. people cannot protect themselves. And if I said something like that, in this interview with this lady uh, that I mentioned, uh, at that very point where I just said that, she would have melted. And there's something in the thinking of so many Brits. Uh, and all I can say is, thank God for George Washington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Was he responsible for the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution? Well, the, the father of the Bill of Rights and of the Constitution uh, is generally considered to be James Madison, a contemporary uh, who at one time, I think, had been uh, governor of Virginia and was in the Continental Congress and was one of the primary authors, uh, a, a Christian, uh, a man who um, uh, clearly understood these issues and was uh, thinking in terms of balancing power so that power would tend to oppose it itself within the same government. Uh, and mm. that was one of the 
unique ideas, I think, of the American Constitution, that we have a judiciary, we have a Congress, and we have an ex a legislative and, a, and an executive uh, that even though unlike South Africa, they're not geographically spread apart, they are uh, definitely intended to be getting in each other's way, uh, mm -hmm. to put to put it that way. And uh, we're uh, we've been blessed to have a system that uh, liberals try to overcome that, and from time to time they do. Uh, but often we've been able to push back, even in the four years that Donald Trump was president. Uh, I think he might still be the elected president, but uh, that's another subject. Uh, he was able to do a lot to restore that original understanding of balancing different parts of the government so that nobody had a monopoly of, of power and authority. And uh, that he understood the genius of America. And I must say, uh, even though I voted for him in 2016, the public image of him was so at best clouded and many times mis mistaken that I thought I was voting for uh, a liberal, someone mildly socialist, but given the choice with Hillary Clinton, uh, of course, I was able to make my mind up quite readily, if not easily, uh, because I knew that Hillary Clinton uh, was trained by Saul Alinsky, a self-avowed small c communist. And yes. Hillary Clinton thought in terms of Hegelian dialectic of always the fight, I think was the name title of her senior uh, thesis at Princeton University. And so we've, uh, we've had this uh, debate, if you will, uh, ever since our very beginning and even before, uh, because there were people that some of whom fled to Canada after the American uh, War for Independence and the Constitution uh, had been established. Uh, they just couldn't give up the idea that there wouldn't be a central locus for all power, namely the king. And so they they left. And uh, But we've still been fighting that fight among ourselves. Uh, it's not that everybody in America gets the, the memo and reads it and understands it the same way. Uh, and that's why we uh, we've had people like Franklin Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, and now Joseph Biden, uh, people who fundamentally think that they were born to rule and that mm -hmm. you and I were born to be ruled. Mm, mm, mm. Well, it, it seems as if uh, the Lord is punishing Joe Biden for his hubris. Uh, it's uh, it, it reminds me of a, of a biblical story, watching him go through the throes of uh, uh, early stage dementia, um, I have to say it, it seems, it just seems, I don't know, but it does seem as if there's some sort of divine participation in his demise, uh, watching him uh, being pulled, pulled across the veranda or patio, uh, veranda restaurant of the golf course, uh, yesterday or the day before, by his minder, by the hand, as you would pull a child uh, out of a, a shop or across a road, uh, was terribly demeaning. Very, very demeaning. What? What? I mean, the guy's treated like an idiot by his own staffers, and one can't help but wonder if it isn't some sort of rep retribution for the wickedness that he well, is. The Democrats into your society. Yeah, uh, the Democrats have themselves, I think, in a real bind because they realize they can see uh, the, the problems you're pointing to. Uh, Joe Biden is not, uh, shall we say, uh, at the top of his game. Um, mm -hmm. And his vice president is someone who was so unpopular among Democrats that she was the first of the many candidates to drop out. She yes. is not a beloved, yes. uh, uh, engaging, endearing sort of person, uh, nor is she that bright. Um, and uh, she has basically made herself, uh, made her way through politics uh, by some very immoral means. Uh, and so it wasn't at all uh, a successful career based on uh, her contribution to the political debate. Uh, 
Uh, mm. Kamala Harris um, is uh, not uh, the sharpest knife in the drawer, as we sometimes say here. Um, mm. And so the Democrats are going into an election where it could well be that Donald Trump will decide he would like to run again. Uh, if God gives him the health, I think he uh, not only would get the nomination, but he would likely win the election uh, with a larger vote than he'd ever had in the past. Uh, mm. People have become very disillusioned, and that's an increasing number of people. And early on our conversation, I pointed to the election in McAllen, Texas. When you lose a Democrat bastion uh, such as that, 80 Five percent Hispanic votes Democrat uh, uh, in lockstep every election. And all of a sudden, in a very solid majority, they vote for a Republican conservative mayor. Wow. Uh, the times are changing. Uh, I know uh, someone in my church who, uh, as they put it euphemistically, uh, doesn't have her papers. Uh, she's from Latin America. She mm -hmm. came a, a, a very perilous a trek, I might say, to, to get here. And she's not a citizen, although that sometime may change. But uh, she's she's not able to vote. So her, been, her opinion doesn't count in that sense. But I, I've asked her uh, and she has explained, that, oh, no, the, uh, the illegals that are coming up now uh, – are extremely dangerous. Uh, there's a gang called MS-13, originated in El Salvador. They make Genghis Khan look like a Sunday school teacher. They are the most vicious and violent people you have ever heard of. And that has even other illegals who are already here very concerned that this could produce a, back, a backlash that could uh, push them back. To, from where they came. Uh, so that, I think, is why McAllen voted Republican, because they're right there at the point of the spear, and they know firsthand just how bad it can be, because it already is. Yes, yes. As it is in South Africa now, we, we live in a society in which the, the crime and the violence and the decay are absolutely out of control. Uh, in 2019, I gave, I was very privileged uh, to be invited to give the keynote speech at the political cesspool radio show annual birthday party in Memphis, Tennessee. And I, I fell quite ill the day prior and I was struggling to concentrate. My eyes were blurry and uh, uh, I, I really struggled to finish my speech. So I, I wrote the speech and I went up to the, stood on the podium behind the lectern <clears throat> and I said to the, uh, to the people gathered there, a very auspicious crowd, um, that I, I was unwell and I said, you know, I showed them my sheaf of handwritten, you know, fully written out speech. I said, I'm, I'm so, I feel so ill that I, I can't concentrate on, on the words, but I think I can stand here and ramble for an hour. I, I, I think I can manage that. If you'll just let me, you know, please forgive me. And, and so I proceeded to talk about my observations of what was occurring in American society. And afterwards, I was invited up to the hotel room of uh, Dr. Michael Hill of the League of the South. And he was entertaining a gentleman, a Southern gentleman with a very uh, broad Southern accent, very elegant uh, speech patterns, if you like, beautiful accent. And this gentleman took offense at what I'd said, the gist of it being, that you in the USA are very, very, very shortly going to experience fractiousness so severe that as individuals, it will be in your best interest to become preppers. I said, I'm, I'm not advocating that you should lose your minds and you know buy a school bus and head out into the Adirondacks or wherever, but this genuine 
unrest in a society far greater than you saw at uh, Kentucky State University, you know, during the Vietnam War, where you see it in different cities at the same time and there's no reconciliation to be made, is certainly coming. I said to them, I don't speak as a guru, but we have watched this movie before. We Absolutely. The conservatives of South Africa. Anyway, this gentleman was very offended by, by what I said. He said, it's never going to happen like that. You're absolutely wrong. And then the Portland riots began last year, and I, I, I started receiving WhatsApp messages from dozens and dozens and dozens of people saying, <clears throat> I was in the room when you gave that speech. I've gotten your telephone number from Mr. Richard A. Hamlin. I've gotten your telephone number from the host. I've gotten your telephone number from Dr. Michael Hill. How on earth could you have been so prescient? And I said to them, I've seen the movie before. <laughs> We've seen the movie before, and that's what Saitlanders is based on. Our leader, our founder, Mr. Gustav Miller, has always said, I am not a guru. I just have to look at the signs around me and follow my Christian faith, allow me myself to be guided by the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to be right nine times out of ten. Uh, it's not arrogance. It's not, you know, it's, uh, haughtiness or, or, or anything like that. Um, but uh, I suppose I've drifted off the topic slightly. The point I wanted to make yeah. was important that point. In listening, yeah, in listening to you, I'm sorely tempted to say to you that what happened in McAllen is fantastic. Donald Trump's potential bounce back would be a wonderful thing for many, many people. My fear is that you guys might have left it too late. My fear yeah. uh, is that the the liberal vanguard is no is now so 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 deeply entrenched in the Supreme Court, which rejected Donald Trump's appeal out of hand, and in other places. I'm just using that by way of example. You you could you could list the other places. The the long march through the institutions of the USA, as it has been described. Um, the Maoist long march through the institutions of the USA is now so far advanced that it may be very, very difficult to recreate the utopic, the utopian United States of America of the uh, of the 21st century, well, of the 20th century. I beg your pardon. What what is your response to to that? Well, the argument you're making is certainly not. Uh ridiculous it, it uh, has to be taken seriously um, and I can't say with uh, total certainty that uh, that isn't going to happen because it certainly could happen um, we we both uh, it seems come from a biblical background uh, and in the scriptures you find examples of people uh, going astray even as our own country uh, and yours as well have gone astray and there are consequences for making mistakes for sin uh, and so we can't just say oh no it's not going to happen in america uh, now i don't think it's too late in america but it is very late uh, it, it's uh, something that americans are going to have to take seriously very seriously more so than uh, we have uh, in the past, uh, in the, certainly in my lifetime, uh, but I think it can be corrected if there is this enormous pushback in our future elections. Uh, we even have some elections for uh, a governor and uh, some local offices this year in uh, the United States and several of the states. And that will give us some um, indication of whether people are uh, indeed responding uh, as they did in McAllen. If McAllen is more than a one-off, if McAllen is the first of uh, several other elections this year, even uh, regularly scheduled elections, uh, that might tell us that Americans have decided that we've had it, that we're not going to put up with this any longer. Uh, and I think uh, 
that's at least possible because people with eyes have been able to see that rioting and murder and arson and robbery and common assault has been increasingly commonplace, mostly in cities that have been governed, that are governed by Democrats, be it San Francisco, Portland, New York, Washington, D.C., uh, and in any number of others. That's where the problem has been most severe, because in other jurisdictions, they know that the police will come and arrest them and put them in jail. Mm-hmm. And that uh, that tends to uh, work, as you might expect. Criminals don't like to have that outcome, but they don't yeah. see that pushback from the authorities in these liberal urban centers. So it may be that those centers have told the rest of the country, this is our future in the United States if we continue this way. And I'm hopeful uh, that uh, that we're going to see other uh, elections that are equally surprising not to have, I'm not talking about a Republican victory in some uh, Republican stronghold, but I'm talking about McAllen, Texas, which was as an incredible turnaround. If that continues to happen, then I think uh, the the uh, liberals are going to have lost the cultural war. Uh, and, and in fact, it will sig- it will signal that many people are aware that we are in a cultural war. It's been mm-hmm. very easy here in the United States. To, what war? What are you talking about? Uh, mm-hmm. I've got a good job. My neighbor has a good job. Uh, The kids are going to school. It's peaceful out here in the suburbs. Uh, What's there to worry about? I don't think people are quite that glib anymore. Yeah, well, hopefully more and more and more people uh, wake up and you're able to wrest your country from the acolytes of of Saul Alinsky uh, because that's, that's who and what it is. You know, uh, we our first uh, black president was uh, Nelson Mandela, and uh, he very famously stood on the the steps of, if I'm not mistaken, St George's Cathedral in Cape Town, and uh, he was asked uh, if uh, he'd been at a, a service, of, an Easter service, if I remember correctly, and he was asked if uh, he was a a Christian, and he gave some sort of mealy mouth answer about the example of Jesus Christ and what have you. And it led to many people believing, well, he didn't say no. And he was at the, the church service celebrating the, the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he, he must be a goodie. He must be, you know, he must be the cowboy, not the, the Indian. He must be the cop, not the robber kind of thing. <laughs> um, and we've it turned out shortly after his death, that he, in fact, had remained clandestinely a, a member of the Central Committee of the South African Communist Party up to his up to his death. And I've recently been doing some research on on something else. In fact, it's related to this conversation. It's the the African National Congress bringing in over two million rifles into South Africa that have, that were never turned in. In other words, when we had peace on reconciliation and all of the excess firearms of the struggle prior to the end of apartheid were meant to be destroyed, the African National Congress never gave up theirs. They gave up about 36,000 in what is known as Operation Mouflon, whereas the other parties you know, gave up everything. So they've, they've, they've hung on to these firearms. And in doing that research, I've discovered to my surprise, that far, far more of our current government are ardent, avowed, card-carrying members and and serving members of the Central Committee of the South African Communist Party. These guys have got away with this murder for so long, people just somehow, it escapes their notice. And it seems... you, you would agree that there's a spiritual dimension to this as well. In the book that Saul Alinsky is famous for, Rules for Radicals, yes. uh, he, he dedicated the book 
uh, and he dedicated it to Lucifer, uh, the one, the rebel who first uh, established a kingdom. Um, so that tells you very clearly uh, the kind of thinking that lies behind that particular communist, that self-described communist, that tutor of um, Hillary Clinton, because uh, after Princeton, she went back to Chicago and she spent uh, quite a bit of time with Saul Alinsky and he had a good deal of influence on her. And it wasn't just in the name of some secular communism. It does have a spiritual root and it's Thank rooted you. in Satan. Thank you very much. You have made my week. You have made Aaron Sponnenberg, our, our producer, you've made his week too. We wish that we could take every conservative, every Saitlander, every God-fearing Christian person in this country by the scruff of the neck and put a gun to their heads and force them to, to learn and to understand this stuff. I want to take it a step further. This is one of my favorite anecdotes. Karl Marx was not an atheist. Karl Marx wrote in the fourth in his fourth critique of Hegel how the the Holy Family had to be destroyed by the destruction of the earthly family. And he, he gave a little bit of a sermon on how the first of all of the priorities of any communist must be to destroy the Christian family because the, the Christian man, the Christian father, observes his family around him, and he uses it as a reference in his mind to comprehend the triune Godhead and the family structure in the manifestation of Christ. I'm not a theologian, so if my terminology is poor, uh, I apologize to, to, to the viewers. Go and read it. Ladies and gentlemen, Saitlanders, go and read how Karl Marx acknowledged the, the, the holiness of our God and encourage people to, to encourage communists to destroy the earthly family so that the Christian father would lose his reference point to the holy family. And in that sense, Christianity would be destroyed. And I'll give one more anecdote uh, in a poem whose name I can remember, I cannot remember, but you can find it very, very easily. Dear St. Londres, beloved St. Londres, fellow St. Londres, Please do this. Go and have a look at Marx's poetry. You'll quickly find there are two poems, one in particular in which he writes about his devotion to darkness, and he writes about how he will continue to struggle against God. In other words, he wasn't speaking allegorically. He was acknowledging that there is a God and that he is committed to the marrow of his bones to destroying that God and that he will rise up in darkness on a towering black mountain, I think he, he, he puts it as, to crush God. Um, uh, it is utterly satanic. Thank you. You've Oh, you don't know how you've made my day, uh, Mr. Pratt. Well, I'm glad that we're able to advance the this point of view. I'm kind of uh, aware that we probably shared it, uh, but it's uh, for somebody to go into this battle, particularly in a political arena, where you don't have the luxury of shooting uh, the bad guy and supposedly ending the problem that way, uh, we're dealing with uh, forces and and uh, things that are in the heavenlies. And it's something that uh, Paul described, that he had fought these battles as well. And I'm sure that as he uh, spent time in what is now called Anatolia in Turkey, he was battling these forces of darkness uh, quite regularly. Uh, so for us to assume that uh, our Christian walk is going to be through uh, a cakewalk through the garden and uh, pleasant and la-di-da, uh, would that it were so, but it's not, hasn't been that way, and it's not likely to be that way until the Lord comes again. So uh, we need to be prepared for the kind of battle that we are in. And yes, these Communists uh, uh, go for guns, uh, and they would like to have a monopoly, as you were describing the ANC. Um, but ultimately, those weapons will not prevail. I'm certainly not saying that we should go 
to war against them without our own uh, physical weapons. But ultimately, the battle is going to be decided in the spiritual realm. And if we go in thinking that we can be as full of ourselves as they are, that we can be as arrogant and, and without God as they are, then we're not likely to have any victories at all. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, but it's a it's a terrifying time for us nonetheless. I, I mean, you're completely right. There's, there's nothing to say uh, except in a fleshly sense, it's terrifying for us as conservatives in this country now to be confronted by this Firearms Amendment Act, uh, whereby we will not be able to keep uh, firearms for the purposes of self-defense, and at the same time to be confronted by the expropriation without compensation law, which the government is, is slowly moving through the parliamentary process, whereby the government will be able to dispossess people of any property, any property whatsoever, particularly farms and livestock and implements, but any property whatsoever. And we will have no recourse to the courts and obviously, the objects of that exercise are going to be white people um, for you historical know. reasons, uh, not for reasons of neurosis or subjective, you know, sensitivity. Uh, we're confronted by the Pepuda law, which is coming in uh, before too long, whereby the government at a local level, a local mayor, can dictate that you have been unfair to somebody, unknowingly perhaps, and that's explicitly written, inadvertently, unintentionally, and potentially not unfairly. So you may have done something without knowing it, and it may have been of no disadvantage to anybody else. But nevertheless, it can be construed as unequal, and you can be punished for it. We're confronted by the National Health Insurance uh, Law, which is coming in right now, whereby... Uh, people with private health insurance will have to fund a national scheme for the entire country. We're confronted by what's known as the Prescribed Assets Act, whereby pension funds, again, utterly dominated, as with the medical aids, the medical funds, utterly dominated by white people. Pension funds will be compelled to devote 20% of their assets to government uh, projects, roads, bridges, hospitals, and the list goes on. There are other laws which are now uh, providing a sort of an all-encompassing siege to and, our, and, de our identity. I beg your pardon. Yes, sir. And we have, as we commented before, we've seen this movie before. And we know how it's going to end up. There'll be lots of laws uh, passed. There'll be lots of lives taken, uh, both by the government and by uh, sanctioned thugs, and there will be a growth of poverty, a spread of poverty uh, and suffering uh, that the people uh, a year or two before all this begins could never have imagined. Uh, yes. Because things have always been going along, at least if you're not a South African farmer, fairly well without uh, a whole lot of uh, real personal encounter with evil, um, uh, probably more likely than not. Uh, and that's going to be coming to an end. And if people don't have their firearms, there won't be a thing they can do about it. It'll be uh, another movie that we've seen so many times before, starting in the Soviet Union in 1917. Guns were confiscated as one of the first things that uh, was embarked upon by Lenin's communist government. Uh, it was one of the first things that was embarked upon when the Nazi government uh, was finally able to solidly uh, entrench itself in power. It's something that th these kinds of totalitarian thinkers envision uh, as to their what they have in mind uh, every single time. And so we will be without excuse because we will have had all these lessons available. We will have had all these warnings available and the graves will be crying out. Why didn't you pay attention? Yeah, ab absolutely. It, it gives so much food for thought. You know, if you, if you reflect on history 
and you consider the circumstances that you're in in the USA now, this this Saul Alinsky type uh, progression of your society um, and what's happening in South Africa, you 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 reach the unavoidable conclusion, or you or you should do that we're, we're emulating things that have gone before. So presumably the results are going to be similar. You know, last year there was a suggestion that the uh, this Firearms Amendment Act would be uh, hurried, that it would be hastened, if you like. And our leader, our founder, Mr. Gustav Miller, was the one and only, the one single in the entirety of South Africa, in the society where you, you would think every last man and his dog would, would rise up. He was the one guy, the one head of an organization that was not a firearms lobbying organization or a firearms interest organization or a firearms activism organization. The one head of an organization devoted to another purpose you know the purpose of state lenders, that is to prepare for an inevitable civil war under the specific provisions of the protocols additional to the Geneva Conventions. The one guy who stood up and said, now we draw a line in the sand. It was, a, it was probably the most powerful message that I've ever heard almost on any theme in the past 30 or 40 years of our country, the most moving video I have ever watched in my life. I'd love to share it with you, but it's in the Afrikaans language. Um, and I just, I suppose what I'm stating for the record is that I'm proud to belong to an organization that has the kind of strength of spine that you've demonstrated over 40 years, that has the uh, Christian conviction around these matters that, that, that you're displaying tonight. It's a it's an encouraging thing in dim times, uh, Mr. Pratt. Well, and that's always the hope that we have before us. And um, uh, recently, I, I was uh, uh, at our church doing a study of Habakkuk, and um, one of the uh, observations of that prophet uh, seems uh, the outlook that they have, and mm. perhaps that's why they fight so desperately because if they lose a battle here for them that's forever yes and for us uh, it, uh, it's a setback we'd rather not have the possibility of uh, doing what God would have us do. And as long as we uh, can see that we're walking in his ways, then I think the outcome is up to him. But it, uh, it's satisfying to me to know that uh, I've done my best to be uh, faithful to him. And he's the judge. We will find the right allies, the right friends, the right uh, teammates in the, in the struggle that lies ahead of us, it looks like it's going to be very difficult to combat these laws, and we are going to be, as a very famous Afrikaner prophet uh, said about 100 years ago, uh, that we will be uh, shorn, if I can translate it correctly, shorn naked with our backs against the wall. In other words, we would be stripped of everything. And uh, that looks like uh, what, what's going to be happening, but the time will tell, and it's, as you say, in the Lord's hands. Mr. Pratt, I must thank you again, and please thank Pleasure. your lady, Courtney Orange, for setting up this interview. And I hope and pray that uh, in the future we may speak to you again, if, if it suits you, if you'd like to come on again uh, one day in the not-too-distant future. That would be my pleasure. Thanks so much.
Thank you. State Londoners, before we go, I want to tell you that we are hoping to have on this show next week, Professor Tom Sunich, one of the foremost, one of the most highly respected, and one of the most lovable conservative Christians in the world today. He's from Croatia, and he's a great friend of ours, so we hope to see you next Thursday evening at the same time when we have Dr. Uh, Professor Tom Sunich here, uh, and I'll ask you to close with, in your hearts, in your homes, uh, some kind of a warm thanks for Mr. Pratt's uh, uh, willingness to come on our show tonight. Thank you, good night, and God bless all of you. Bye-bye.